Today's guest is probably the first person I thought about getting on uh, when I decided to start this podcast. In his playing career, he took 208 test wickets in 44 matches for Australia and 774 first-class wickets, mainly for New South Wales, but he also had stints with Nottinghamshire in county cricket. I first met him back in 2015 when I sought him out for some coaching and since then he's been a massive mentor and mate for me. Personally, his impact on my career is profound, but he's also influenced other English leggies since then, including working lots with Matt Critchley and helping Mason Crane and Matt Parkinson progress on to playing for England. Welcome to the Spin Badger podcast, Stuart McGill. Love you, Badger. (laughs) Right, we'll start at the beginning, Stuart. So, going back to when you were a young pup, not that long ago, obviously. Like, how obviously. Did you, <laughs> how did you get into bowling leggies? You know, mate, uh, if you were to wish something for a child, I don't think bowling wrist fin would be it. Uh, it's one of the most thankless jobs on the planet. But um, my... Father and my grandfather played for Western Australia. Um, your granddad, got, your granddad my, got Bradman out, didn't he? Yeah, my granddad got Bradman out, and uh, in the same game, made seventy-four uh, in the first innings, opening the batting, opened the batting and bowling. He was uh, he was average, uh, but he yeah, and also he had a good temper as well. Cheers, Grandpa. Um, <laughs> but um, I, my dad, bowled leg spin. And, but one of his best friends is Dennis Lilly, and I always wanted to be Dennis. Uh, growing up, I used to, you know, copy his autograph, used to watch everything he did. The only thing I remember about cricket when I was growing up is Dennis Lilly, but I was never able to bowl fast. Uh, and then when I was about six or seven years old, uh, I was playing cricket in, a, in the back garden with a friend of mine, my best friend, Michael Simpson. And his dad said, what did you do just then? That was a googly. And I didn't even know what a googly was, but my dad was a leggy. And I watched every single ball he played in, uh, in club cricket uh, in Perth. And I went, oh, was it really? And that made a huge impact on me. Because I thought, well, if that was a googly and I'm good at it, maybe I should do that too. So I still tried to bowl fast. But then when I didn't get any wickets, because I never did, because I was useless as a fast bowler, I bowled leggies. And that didn't even really come together until I was 16 or 17 either. So, But it was encouraging to know that I was good at something. Yeah, everybody likes to think they're good at something. Yeah, well, you definitely were good at uh, in the end, Stuart. Um, so, I guess... What so, do you mean in the end? What do you well, mean in the end, Josh? Are you suggesting Sorry, that... Sorry, from when you first got Google, <laughs> going, yeah. uh, So, Graham, like, staying with when you were younger, so... Yes. So, you're from uh, Western Australia originally, and that's... Yes. Um, did you only play grey cricket in Western Australia? So, I am a big believer. There's, 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 there's this great show um, floating around, uh, you know, on the streaming platforms at the moment called uh, sort of like In Search of Excellence. Everybody's talking about the Jordan show, but Jordan is also on this one, so In Search of Excellence. And one of the big things that the message that comes through in this is that a lot of people who eventually make it to the top level in professional sport have played a lot. And when I say play, I mean they played in the back garden, they played in the back alley, they played in the street, the back lane, Um, they're basketballers, they played street ball, you know. And, And I really, I really liked that. Um, I didn't play any state junior representative cricket until I was 19. And that was, even that was an accident. One of my dad's mates was the coach of the WA under 19 team and said, my dad and him and, you know, mum and his wife went out for dinner 
on a Friday night and Les said to my dad, what's Stuart doing? And dad said, oh, he's playing second grade at North Perth. Les said, what does he do? Oh, he's a leggy. And Les went, we don't have any spin bowlers in the team. Where's he playing tomorrow? And on he came and watched. I bowled 30 overs. I think I got three for, you know, 100 or something like that, um, which is perfectly respectable, kids. It's not about the runs. It's about the wickets. Uh, but on the Monday, they called me up and I got invited to training with I didn't know it was the WA under 19s team but it was the WA state under 19s team and we went away <laughs> but I remember training and then saying to us okay cool so we're going to Melbourne got to be at the airport at you know this time on Sunday and I'm going why I, di I didn't even know that there was such a thing but I firmly believe that the fact that I wasn't fixated on getting a tracksuit as a 12 year old meant that I appreciated every single step that I took from that point on. And my, my son now is 17 and I didn't let him play rep cricket in Sydney until he was 16. I just, I think, there's far too many kids who get very excited about their achievements when they're 12. And, um, well, I can't remember what 12 was like now, so it's good. Yeah, I think that's probably quite a common trait in cricketers and you know, like spinners in particular who go and do well as they have that, you know, they're not really involved as much when they're younger and then no. kind of have that real inner, inner drive. But we're going to go back and forwards throughout history, but... You touched on I don't that, mind. Like, it's all about wickets. What, like, what does that mean to you? Like, you know, you did, did that. Did, like, I'm going to probably lead you on stuff we've spoken about before, but with wickets, yeah. like, you set goals with for things like number of wickets you want to get. So for me, um, a game of cricket, the bowlers set matches up for batsmen to complete. I. I you know, obviously I'm a bowler and I can't bat, so I'm a little bit biased. But I believe that bowlers win matches. You, If you're playing a short form of the game, even if it's a 20-20 or a 50-over game, there's 10 wickets to get. If you're playing a, a, a four- or five-day game, if you, you know, let's say county or state or, you know, international game, it's four or five. And there's 20 wickets to get. As far as I'm concerned, the quicker you get those 10 or 20 wickets, the easier you make it for your batsman to win the game. And what I believe is that bowlers should focus on achieving that goal as a group, not as an individual, as a group, as quickly as possible. So... If you and I are playing in the same team, I don't really mind if you're getting the wickets or I'm getting the wickets because you might get them today, I might get them tomorrow, it doesn't matter. But the quicker we can get there, the quicker the batsmen can get the runs and the quicker we win the game, the quicker we can sit down in the changing rooms after and tell each other how good we are. Um, when I come on the bowl, and I, I believe this is very important, if you look on if you know if any of you are lucky enough to ever do a tour at Lords or any of the test grounds in the UK or around the world, you'll see the honour boards, and they have the you know the hundreds on one board and the five wicket balls on the other board. The number of people who just get five wickets is ridiculous, and the reason they just get five wickets is their goal is to just get five wickets because they want to get on the honour board. The best thing that I was ever told, and I was, it, was, it was told to me by Ashley Mallett, who nobody who's listening to this will have ever heard of, but he was probably, before Nathan Lyon, the best finger spinner to ever play for Australia. He's actually been uh, uh, mentioned he, on this podcast already because he worked with... Uh, oh, man. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
Spoke very highly. He's a champ, man. No, no. He is, and he's a lovely bloke too. And he's a champion. Um, but he said to me when I was about uh, early 20s, he said to me, when you come on the bowl, look at the scoreboard, see how many wickets are left. And your goal is to take the rest of the wickets. So don't stop at five. If there's eight wickets to go, and, and don't, don't get upset if you don't get all eight, but your goal should be to take the eight wickets because somebody in your team has got to do it. So you aim to take the remaining wickets uh, when you come on the bowl. Associated with that, everybody says, don't try and take a wicket every ball. Now, for me, don't expect to take a wicket every ball. But why wouldn't you bowl your best ball as often as you possibly can? And so for me, like if your best ball is a leg spinner that pitches middle and leg and clips the top of off, I'd suggest you probably bowl that as often as you can. And that's a wicket ball. So I'm not deflated if I don't take a wicket every ball but I am trying to take a look at every ball. And it's just a way of looking at things. It's not, it's not, I'm trying to set people up to do as well as they possibly can, not to be deflated, but try and take a look at every ball. <laughs> that, uh, so that best, best ball that you spoke about, I'm going to take you back. Yeah. Back to 2015, I said, when we first met. Um, I Can remember you believe how long ago that is? Yeah. Isn't that, mate, 2015? Yeah. My God. It's scary. But uh, I remember after our first session, you sent me homework, and that homework was to go away and write about like, what my best ball was. Do you remember that? Yes. Um, I do remember it. that. Look, man, and, and I'm, I, actually, I'm really pleased you still have it. Because, and it's funny, you know, people listening might think it's funny that I set your homework, but, but I actually, particularly when I'm coaching, and bearing in mind, you weren't, a, you weren't 10, you weren't 12, you're, you're an adult who'd played county cricket and you're an accomplished, you know, first-class player, but I am like a headmaster and I... I, I I treat, you know, the guys that I'm coaching, I'm quite firm about the way that I do things. And I did. I, I think I even called it homework. And I, I said to you, you, you write this, you go and buy yourself an exercise book. You write this down. I want you to define your best ball, which is your wicket ball, your best ball. Define it. Write down as much about it as you possibly can. And if you don't, don't come back, right? It's a big thing for me because how do you know what you're going to do when you're at the top of your mark unless you know exactly what you're going to do? And credit to you, Mr. Poison, you did it. And uh, I'm very pleased that you still have it because that's a part of it as well. It's a, it's a constantly evolving thing. My my roadmap or my blueprint or my description of my best ball, if I were to write it down today, is very different than if I'd written it down, you know, 15 years ago. And in fact, I, I don't play many games of cricket nowadays. I play maybe two or three games a year and I only bowl three overs, four overs max because I can't walk for a week. But last year well actually yeah late last year I added to my blueprint my my best ball Love that. my description of my yeah man even the, and this is the thing I worked out how to bowl because I hadn't been able to bowl the wrong and for uh, so I finished playing test cricket in 2008 I haven't been able to bowl the wrong and since about 
2013, 14, maybe. And I remember you, I remember you bowling one at me in the nets, and obviously. Oh, there we go. My batting's probably a different topic, but um, <laughs> literally just like ragging past me. So maybe still. Well, well, that's it. good news because that means that that's even more recent. But you don't know how many times I'd tried to bowl it before yeah. it actually came out. Yeah. But I've worked out now how to do it, and I wrote it down, even though I'm not playing anymore. And once you are able to define something and if something feels good and it works for you it doesn't matter if it's the same as me or it's the same as you if if it works for you and it works out make sure that you own it and make sure you write it down because now i look i played a game in port macquarie uh, it must have been early 2020 and got three or four wickets and the first one pitched about 20 centimetres outside of off and hit the top of middle. And everybody sort of thought, oh, yeah, well, you know, of course. But me inside, I was losing it, like, because I'm kind of going, oh, my. Like, I, I genuinely... I was bouncing around for days because only I knew how ridiculous it was that I actually managed to do it. And it was only because I'd written it down. Yeah. It's, it's a good thing to do. You said, you said at the start that leg spin can be quite a, a thankless task, but I think moments like that are when it's, it's worth it and you get that, oh, those good feelings. You got no idea, mate. I, I was... The game that I was playing it was in Port Macquarie. It was a bushfire thing. And um, because, as you know, in Australia over the summer, we had pretty bad bushfires. And um, Port Macquarie was the first place to burn. And the game, um, um, Stuart Clark and Mark Waugh and Brad Haddon were playing. And Mark Waugh was at first slip. And he said to me afterwards, he said, I mean, you can imagine, because I'm a little bit of a fit, bit, yeah, spin badger. But I was a badger way before you were. And he, he, he said to me, he's at first slip, he said to me after the game, he said, man, you never bowled that good before. <laughs> which, which, which is cool. I, I loved it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you, you really, you can't underestimate the strength of paying attention exactly to what you're doing it's uh, it's it's powerful yeah and i think that that detail is key like i think for any spinners listening you may want to try the exercise like i for example in my one i remember it had exactly how i mark my run up out yeah like how many steps how i actually like spray it with the paint you know everything yes. what angle is it you know what what's your first step like that that in detail that you always have to go back to well look I always talk about, and I think the first thing that we worked on, you know, way back then, when uh, when you and I first met, I said to you, we're going to start with the run-up. Uh, and I, I say run-up, it's just because that's the term that's used. Let's say approach, I don't care if you walk, run, crawl, skip, irrelevant. Let's just call it run-up for the sake of the conversation. I think that was the thing that I first said to you. And most people I talk to about that, they look at me and they kind of go, man, are you going to teach me how to bowl or not? I was a pretty inconsistent bowler because the only thing I was interested in was ripping it as far as I could, which isn't necessarily the right way to go about it. But that was what I did, okay? But what I think is the most important, how are you going to have any consistency whatsoever if you start from a different spot every time you bowl and you let go of the ball from a different spot every time you bowl? And most people who I ask, and I'm sure you're included, uh, I say, which foot do you start off from? 
How many steps? Where do you take, where do you mark it from? Are you using a tape measure? Or are you using your feet? So many people use their boots. And then I say, well, you're 12 years old, man. What's going to happen when you're 15 and you've got three you know, sizes too big? Like, I, even I remember uh, Matt Critchley, who mentioned earlier, um, the first time I saw him bowl, I said to him, so which foot do you start off from? And, you know, I can't remember which it was, right or left. But then I filmed him and he actually took a step back with the other foot before he started. And he didn't even know. And that's totally fine. But if you don't know how you're going to re replicate it, because it's all about repetition and doing it again and again and again. And the more things that you can fill your head with that are good and that are familiar, the less things can go wrong. Definitely. I think a lot of stuff we're speaking about today is probably stuff that I've harped on about throughout all of this, these podcasts, because I think my, I guess my bowling philosophy is probably taken a lot from stuff I learned from you, but it like, is another part of that trying to bowl your best ball that if you don't quite bowl it and miss a little bit, it's still not going to be a bad ball. Is that part of your, the thought process behind that mindset? So the thing is, if you're trying to bowl your absolute best ball every single ball with no variation so you just run in and try and do the same thing over and over and over again and you don't get it right because you've got to remember man in all walks of life people make mistakes and you make a mistake but if you're trying to do the same thing over and over and over again when you make a mistake it's going to be that much different it's not going to be that much different. It's going to be that much different. And that means the ball's going to be there, 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 there. You know, in the olden days, they used to talk about bowling to a, a you know, a rag on the pitch or something like that, you know. Um, it's probably not unreasonable to hit the rag every single ball once you feel good if you're trying to bowl exactly the same ball every single time. But if it hits each corner of the rag or the flannel or whatever you want to call it, that is variation. And so why do you need to bowl a wrong or a toppy or a backy or a slider or a, a flipper or you don't need to, you don't need to do that if because I don't know anybody apart from maybe warning um, who can run in and bowl the same ball and hit the same spot every single time most normal people run in and bowl and if they're trying to bowl the same thing every time, it is slightly different. And there's your variation. It might even, you know, maybe when you run up, maybe there's a little bit of a hole. Maybe the grass has deteriorated and you slip a bit. So it might be a little bit slower. Maybe, you, you know, somebody in the background was calling your name out and saying, you know, Stewie, you're a Muppet. Uh, who, uh, you never know what's going on, but those slight variations are all it takes to get a great batsman out. We're not talking about, because when you're playing under 12s or under 11s, the kids that get all the wickets, they bowl moon balls. They just chuck it way up in the air, and they, people call it bowling spin, but none of those guys will ever play first class cricket. Um, if you run in and try your hardest to bowl your best ball every ball, it's highly likely that that's all the variation you need. When Shane, uh, when Warney played 
um, test cricket at, right at the beginning. He had a ridiculous leg spinner that drifted unprecedented amounts and turned big, and he had a flipper. That's it. Two balls. That's it. So don't think, and I, and I see it all the time, kids coming to me, you know, they're 12, 13, 14 years old, and they say, I've got everything. Wrong and flipper, toppy, zuda, slider, I got it all. And then, man, do you need them? And I, I think I told you this, uh, you know, probably five years ago. People say to me, what do you do when a new batsman comes in? And I say, bowl your best ball. And then they, and now I remember, I, I'm not going to mention the guy's name because he, he played a couple of games and I, I don't want to embarrass him. But, but and then he said to me, he said, but what if they've been in for two overs? What do you do then? And I said, how many times in those two overs do you think you've actually bowled your best ball? I said, twice and over, once and over. I tell you what, I'll be nice to you, three times and over. And he said, well, yeah, yeah, maybe. And I said, well, how about you just try and hook up all of your best balls and bowl as many of them as you can in a row and see how you go there before you change your plan. Because even Brian Lara, who was the greatest player of spin bowling, I think, of all time, he could hit your best ball for four once. He could hit it for four twice. He could hit it for six the third time. And you change the field. But it's a staring competition. And I'd change the field and he'd hit it somewhere else. He's a freak. He was, he's the greatest bowler that's been over bowled. But at some point, they're going to get bored. I don't care if he hits me for four or three times. He hit, I was playing in Antigua once and Lara hit me for the biggest six I've ever been hit for. They're still looking for the ball. And I bowled him the, I bowled him the next ball. So guess what? I don't care. Yeah, I, th I think a reason why it's, it's such a good mindset to have is like, it's so many reasons. But first of all, like, it's so, first of all, it's simple. Like, it takes everything off what's happening at the other end. Yes. You're bowling your best ball, no matter what. I think also one thing that I think worth is worth saying is like, it's the same for all three formats, isn't it? Like, yes. in T20, it's still trying to bowl your best ball because they can't consistently hit that for six, like you're saying. You know, we've, right. we've, We've had a lot of conversations on this podcast where like, it's all really um, kind of complex tactical things in T20, like people trying to bowl Yorkers. But at the end of the day, like, if you bowl your best ball, <laughs> it's... Rubbish, not... mate. Yeah. And, I, I uh, think... and, 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 and listen, Mr. Badger, I'll call you Mr. Badger out of respect. <laughs> uh, I understand why people talk about this, but I watch young wrist spinners around the world who have enormous promise ruining themselves in as a direct result of short form cricket because they're trying to keep the runs down if you bowl your best ball it means it can only be hit safely in one place. That makes a huge difference in field placement. Mm. As a spin bowler, the hardest thing to do is to get the batsman to play a shot. In 2020 cricket, man, they're playing a shot every ball. The shorter the form of the game, the easier it became. And, and, and if I... Well, I was going to say, if I had a flaw, one of my many flaws <laughs> was that I got kind of a little bit lazy as the, the games became shorter because I just kind of went, well, look, I can just run in and let it go. 
and I didn't really bowl. I bowled a straight one, so we call it a slider or a zutta or whatever you want to call it. But a straight one and a normal leg spinner turning away from the right-handed batsman in short form cricket. That was it. The only time I would ever bowl a wrong in short form cricket was to a tail ender or to a left-handed batsman. Yeah. I, I just didn't even bother with it. But straight and a leg spinner, which meant that I could have a cow and then a couple of guys out on the offside. It just makes life so much easier. And you said something very, very good that I liked very much. That was the approach that we're talking about today just makes things simple. Um, what we're trying to do is very, very difficult. And we don't need to make it any more difficult than it is already. It's very, very, it's difficult. Our grandmothers, I've, I've told you this many times too, our grandmothers could hit us for six. But the question is, could they hit us for six two balls in a row? <laughs> um, and that's the way you got to look at it, man. Like I, and don't get embarrassed when you do get hit for six because the game is not decided on how far. And I, I know, you know, I'm big bash and IPL and all that sort of stuff. When somebody hits a six, they, they tell you how many metres it's gone. <laughs> if they start deciding matches based on metres, then maybe I've got a problem. <laughs> But at, but at the moment, that's not how it's decided. It's decided on uh, who gets the most wickets quickest and who manages to make the runs that are on the scoreboard. And that's the bit that we need to focus on. And for any young girls or, or boys that are playing, if you get hit for a four, the first thing, I, I told you this too, if somebody hits you for a six or a four, the first thing the batsman will do is look straight at you. <laughs> and they'll go, and uh, they, might, they might not say anything, but they'll look straight at you and they'll go, oh, what do you think about that then? And you know what I did? I turned around and I walked back because I don't care. All I care about is the next best ball, the next best ball. And the fact that they look at you proves that they're not on the same page as you. All we got to do is get those wickets as quick as we can to help the batsmen because they're not as smart as us. <laughs> yeah, and I think, that, like, obviously we're talking a lot about the same subject here, but I think one more thing to say about that best ball mentality is that that, that best ball isn't just about where it lands, is it? It's about putting loads yeah. on it. So you get that drift, you get the drop and you get the spin. And if you have that, if you have that intense, but that much on the ball, like I said, even if far bad ball, if it's still got a lot on it, it's still going to hopefully give you chances. Do you know what, you know what, uh, Josh? Um, sorry, Mr. Badger. Um, do you know, um, it almost doesn't even matter. You don't, because when you say get lot in, getting lots on it, so, uh, most people think that it's got to turn sideways. It's not even really about that. One of the players on the planet that I have a lot of time for at the moment is Adam Zampa. And um, he doesn't turn it sideways as much as I did. But I love the way he bowls because he knows exactly what he wants to do. His best ball is his own best ball. And when, and he tries to do it every single ball and his, his numbers in limited overs cricket. And I, I think he's a stoop. I think he's great. You know, to be honest, I think he's a superstar, but but I'm biased because I, I like him. So I don't want to, you know, you know, amp it up too much because, you know, people think, oh, you like him. So, you know, but 
the reason I like him is because he owns what he's got. It doesn't matter if you turn it sideways. It doesn't matter if it fizzes through the air. What matters is you work out what your best ball is, you decide to bowl it, and then you try and bowl it as often as you can. If it goes down leg, it's just a mistake. You don't then try and adjust so it's, you know, a metre outside off stump. You just try and bowl the same ball over and over and over. And Zamps is, I, I think that he's a very, very good example. Uh, Stephen O'Keefe, the same. Stephen O'Keefe, uh, who plays for New South Wales and has played for Australia, um, same thing. I spent a lot of time with him trying to teach him how to do something that he doesn't do. And then he told me one day, he said, I know exactly why you're trying to get me to do that. But what I try and do as a left arm finger spinner is I try and pitch it five centimetres outside of stump to the right-handed batsman to hit off stump. And every now and then, it kicks and bounces. And all sorts of things happen. And I think to this day, he is the Australian bowler with the most wickets in a match in India. And actually, I don't think the Australian. I think he is the international bowler with the most wickets in an Indian test match. Um, and he did it the way that he knew how to do it. And that's the bit that I want people to do. And if I was to coach anyone tomorrow, it would be let's work out what you're good at and then let's work out how to do it more often. Yeah, that's great advice. I think like the two things there, like you said, it's what happens in the air is so important. It's not just how much it spins. Because like... Especially as you go up the levels, you're going to play on wickets that don't have that don't spin much. So, what you can do in the air is probably going to be the one consistent thing. And I think that owning what you do is massive. So, you know, being aware that not everyone is a uh, Stuart McGill who rags it two meters. You know, you, you might not be a big spinner of the ball, and owning that and knowing what what fields are going to work for you that can be something that's equally as important. So, with the fields, the only way you can set a field is, and, and I'm sorry if I'm leaping forward here, but once you've defined that best ball and so you know what your best ball is and what's going to happen once you've bowled it. And this is actually something that it, it applies to all bowlers. It's not just spin bowlers. It's not just wrist spinners or finger spinners, all bowlers. Once you've defined your best delivery, you've got a fair idea which arc uh, you can be scored in. But more importantly, because that's what it's all about, you know where your wickets could come from. So part of defining your best ball is visualising how that best ball is going to take a wicket. Everybody always complains about, oh, the captain always sets the bad field. He doesn't know where the field placings are, he treats me very, you know, I think that's just absolute junk and uh, I think it's a, a weak option for weak people I'm sorry, it's a weak option for weak people if you own your best ball and you know where it's going to go you should know where the wickets could potentially come from so for me, my best ball pitches middle and leg to either clip the top of off or take the corner of the bat. So I've got a wicket keeper first slip, short backward point, short cover, mid off. And if they have a slog, maybe a cow. It's definitely in front of square. That's not for everyone. That's for me. That's not ten field, uh, nine fieldsmen. That, that's nothing. So 
you can say to the captain, this is what I'm trying to bowl. This is where I'm trying to bowl it. Potentially, the wickets could come here, 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 and here. Put the rest of the fieldsman where you want. And so a lot of people criticise me because I have a deep point sometimes. I don't care. I wasn't bowling to get hit the deep point. I was bowling to get him caught at first slip or caught at short cover or, you know, caught and bowled or caught behind or stumped. That's what I was focusing on. But if you've got all of those wicket-taking positions in play, the rest of the guys really, I know it sounds juvenile, but they can scatter. You put them wherever you want. And if they save runs, that's just a bonus um, because it just allows me to go back to the top of my mark and try and bowl my best ball again. And then we get them out because we always do because we're better. Yeah, I think like you said, being just being able to have that, that focus is key. And I remember even like you said about top of your mark, about that box you talk about and, you know, that's, that's your space. Yeah. So what Josh is talking about with the box when you mark your runner, your starting point, wherever that may be, and it doesn't matter where it is. Remember, I don't mind whether you skip, crawl, walk, you know, do handstands. But I used to always mark a right angle in the ground. And that was my starting point. And it's almost like, I know it sounds a little bit warm and fuzzy but it was my safe place. But that's where I started from. And if you know where you start from, that's where you can collect yourself. You can think about your best ball. You can think about what you're about to do. I never looked at the face of the batsman. Didn't matter who was there. Just the fuzz down the end, probably because my eyes were bad. But it was more about it was more about not focusing on the batsman. It was about focusing on what I wanted to do and I wanted to bowl my best ball. Um, so I'd stand in my little right angle and also slightly technical, always exhale before you start off. So just before you start your run up, so just before you're about to run in or walk in or whatever you do. So if you look at me now and I breathe in, I go, and my shoulders go up and I'm like tense and I'm like, that's no good. What you do is, and I know shooters do this, like so Olympic uh, shooters and, you know, they, they breathe out. You breathe out and when you breathe out, you let everything relax and sag kind of and when you do that you just take it off then because that's it's like go and that's that's where it's at and so you start off mark your run up however you want to mark it up make sure it's the same every single time breathe out and go yeah, I think that deep breath is something that you probably see with most, if not all, of the bowlers you've worked with. Like I know, just think on top of my head, like I, know, I definitely still do it now. I spoke about on this podcast, like um, pretty sure Parky does it. Like it is something that is completely in your control, but can make a lot of difference. I think. I mean, as a bowler, it's like taking a penalty kick in football. Um, there is nobody involved in what you're about to do, apart from you. The batsman is actually irrelevant. It doesn't matter where they move, what they do, whether they've hit you for three sixes in a row. It's absolutely inconsequential to what you're about to do. Now, what you're about to do is totally in your control. It's just whether or not you are able to take that deep breath in, breathe out and relax, focus on 
you go and do it. And the people, I remember when I was playing for Knots, a lot of the time, the televised games, bowlers would get really, really nervous because they didn't want to get embarrassed. You get embarrassed, play tennis. It's We are taking a penalty kick. The batsman, once we've let go of the ball, I can't do anything more about it, but I can do everything about it before I let go of the ball. And that's the only thing that any bowler needs to concentrate on. And if we get it right and they hit us for four, cool, no problem. Or six, cool, no problem. Go back to your mark and get it right again. Can they do it twice in a row? Can they do it three times in a row? Will they get bored after doing it three times in a row? And then all of a sudden we're in the game even against the best in the world. You spoke about uh, playing for knots there and obviously being from warm, well, warm uh, Perth, then Sydney, playing in England probably offered a bit of a different challenge. And I know you've told me this story before, but I think really good to share like this, the, how specific you got your training. Like, did you ever do anything uh, to help you bowl with when like, the ball was wet? Yeah, I, I did actually. I was very lucky the first summer I was there, actually, um, it wasn't wet. <laughs> but I reckon if you think about, so when people way smarter than me are faced with the challenge, they do their pros and cons lists. All of the things that could possibly go wrong. So I used to bowl with a flannel tucked into my waist and that was part of all of the things that I could possibly complain about I wrote them down because for me I didn't want somebody to say oh well that's okay Stuart you bowled rubbish today because you know blah 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 I went no I'm going to think about it before they do and I'm going to deal with it, and I'm going to try and work it out. So I always used to have a flannel so that it, it wasn't, you know, I could never complain about slippery. I always used to have, um, a, what's the stuff that I use, mate? The uh, control grip. Yeah. Um, never used to take it on the field. It's completely legal because... I used to put it on my hands before play. So you're not allowed to put anything on your hands during play, but you are allowed to do it beforehand. It's just like washing your hands, but you're washing it with... It's a, it's a resin-like thing. From um, Canada? Is that but, right? Oh, man, I, I, I don't really... I used to buy it from wherever that I could get it from, but it was a 10-pin bowling product, funnily enough. <laughs> um, but it, 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 it was like, because in Australia, of course, it gets really sweaty and hot and gross. Um, so slippery, don't ever use slippery as an excuse. You're not allowed to take it on the field. That's cheating. But um, beforehand, no problem. So my hands were always dry. I had my flannel. I'd always make sure if it was cold, I had hand warmers. Um, massive uh, I, inside secret that hand warmers are absolute and, <laughs> and you have to have them and, <laughs> and I, would, I would get very very grumpy because I used to have in my, in my kit I used to have 20 or 30 flannels you know because I was always prepared for anything bad that could possibly happen and even um, when I came back years after I finished uh, for Big Bash 1, um, well, while I was playing, uh, played against New Zealand uh, for New South Wales, and Dean Jones was coaching the New Zealand batsmen, and I'd heard a whisper that uh, they were going to complain about my flannel. 
because they said it was distracting. So, because it's a bit of a security blanket. Once it's there, you get used to it being there. And so I practiced with it behind my back. I tucked it in behind. And then Stephen Fleming, who was the captain of New Zealand, obviously at the time, very famous and successful player, he complained about it. And I went, cool, no worries. And I put it behind my back and just kept bowling because I'd prepared for it. During Big, Big Bash 1, I had the, because uh, the, I was playing for the Sixers and we had black trousers, black cricket pants. And my flannel was uh, white. And it was my mum actually uh, bought me black flannels. And they complained about, I was playing against the Adelaide Strikers and they complained about the colour of, because it's a white ball, complained about the colour of the flannel. And so I waved to the changing rooms and got a black flannel. Uh, end of story. And, and the look on people's faces when you, you know, when you deal with that sort of stuff is priceless. It's actually worth playing sport for that look. But the same thing goes, as you mentioned, with the wet balls. Um, I, and I've told a lot of people about this, but I don't know anybody that's ever actually done it apart from me. I, bowling wrist spin with a wet cricket ball is, uh, I don't know if there's much harder in sport. I, I couldn't bowl my best ball with a wet cricket ball. But what I did know is that nobody liked bowling with a wet cricket ball. And sometimes you play and the ball's wet. And so I figure, as I did my whole career, if I bowl half the overs, I get half the wickets. So I needed to work out how to do it. And so I had a bucket of water. Well, I had a bucket of water at the top of my mark. It, this is during, during training. Yeah. Bucket of water. I put half a dozen balls in the water. I left them there for half an hour. And then I bowled with them. And I worked out what I could and couldn't bowl with a wet ball. It, it, so my best ball with a wet ball was very, very different to my best ball with the dry ball. But I worked out how to bowl. And some of my favourite games ever were with a wet ball. And what I would do is, so backspin a slider, zutter, whatever you want to call it, I would bowl that as my stock ball. And sometimes it would, because with a wet ball, there's normally a wet pitch as well. So it would sort of deck one way or the other, you know, depending on which way the seam was. So I'd bowl backspin, a backspin, a backspin. That was my stock ball. But then every now and then you'd get one back, you'd get the ball back and you go, ooh, that's, that's almost dry. And so I'd get my flannel out and I'd try and dry it off a little bit more and I'd feel it and I'd go, that's dry enough. And so my variation was my leg spinner. And I, it was, it was ridiculous. And when I say how many wickets I got, it was ridiculous that I was able to stay on during those periods of time. I actually remember one morning against South Australia here, uh, here at the SCG, I got three wickets in my first over with a wet ball. And <laughs> and it wasn't out of disrespect, but I was laughing because it was just, I just thought, how on earth is this happening? And now that I'm old and, you know, grumpy and can talk down to you people, um, <laughs> it's because I prepared for it. So I shouldn't have been surprised. Everything that you think could possibly go wrong on a day of cricket, you should already have encountered at training because you decided to. Yeah, and I think that flannel is another pro 
probably like common characteristic that you see like the spinners you work with like i i always use one now like you said you almost feel naked about it i know parky does mason definitely does so it's you know it's i guess another one is little little nuggets that we've taken away from you well you're talking about the security blanket <laughs> yeah um, i'm very sorry about that man you you the last thing i want for any of you guys is to be like me because that would be a very bad thing <laughs> I don't know Matt. Um, talking again about that thinking outside the box in terms of your training uh, we're going to take you back to the game you played for Australia against the ICC World Eleven. yeah and I just wondered in your preparation for that game if you remember that if you did anything different in the build up to that I do yes I did no, leading question, Mr. <laughs> Badger. You remember what I said to you. So um, the ICC World Eleven game has been widely dismissed as an irrelevance, but that has upset me for quite some time because the best batsmen and bowlers in the world were picked to play against an Australian team that had just been beaten for the first time in 17 years by England in the Ashes. So it's 2005. I was on the 2005 Ashes tour. I didn't get to play a game and I was a bit grumpy, but it also meant that I hadn't played much. And so I was pretty... I really, really, well, I really, really wanted to play on that 2005 Ashes Tour. Um, but when I got selected in the 11 for the World 11 game at the SCG, I was a bit anxious because I hadn't played a test match for a while. And because I, because I'd told people that I was very unhappy that I hadn't played. Particularly, well, so 05 Ashes, I wanted to play at um, Old Trafford, Edge Baston, and the Oval. Uh, the Oval, the Oval was the last deciding Test match. If Australia had won it, it would have meant that the series was drawn, and Australia would have retained the Ashes, and so. I was sure I was going to play because the only thing I'm interested in is wickets and we needed to beat England. So I was sure I was going to play. And so I was, as I've said before, uh, reasonably grumpy. Uh, and so I let people know that I, you know, I was very disappointed that I wasn't playing and thought that I should have played, blah, blah, blah. But that means that, you know, you've got, if you talk it, you've got to walk it. Um, so I was, I was nervous before the ICC game. And there were some proper players in that team. You know, what do we have? You know, Saywag, Callis, you know, Flintoff was playing, uh, Dravid. It was, it, was, it was a ridiculous team. It was a ridiculous team. It, it, I don't even want to think about it because it makes me nervous. Um, but the day before the game, as I said to you before, when I was running into bowl to a batsman, I didn't look at the batsman. What I did was try and make sure that I did what I did. But that is not the easiest thing to do. And sometimes you do feel down on yourself and you do feel embarrassed and unsure of what you're doing and so the day before the game I called a mate of mine who doesn't play sport and I said to him I want you to come to the nets at the SCG and put the pads on and he said I man I, I can't bat I said yep that's right that's exactly right I said I want you to put the pads on and I want you to try and hit every single ball I bowl to you for six. And he said, well, well what's, what are you talking? I said, man, just don't ask questions. 
please do what I ask you to do. And uh, Marcus came down. Marcus Borden, cool guy. He, 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 uh, he came down, put the pads on, batted, and couldn't lay that on ball. I think I got him out 20 or 30 times in an hour. And when we left the nets, then we went out for dinner or lunch. Or, but I felt like I was the greatest bowler of all time. I felt, I just felt, mag- I, I felt so good about myself, it wasn't funny. And it was a completely contrived situation. But you know what? It worked. And I went out to play that game feeling like I was in peak condition and in peak form. And I had a great game and we won easily. I think between the two of us, Warney and I got something stupid like 17 of the 20 wickets. So it was... It's a good technique. I remember my dad played, you know, 25 years of first grade cricket in Perth. And he said to me the best season he ever had with the bat in first grade, he batted in the third grade net all year because every ball hit the middle of his bat. It's like, it's like a it's batsman regularly go into the nets with a bowling machine. The ball hits exactly where they want it to hit. What's the difference? There's no shame in making yourself feel good. Definitely. Well, I think uh, tell Katie to pad up soon. I can have a little ball. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you mentioned there about in that World Eleven game, you and Warren got 17 of the 20 wickets. What was it like with Warren? Like, did you share a lot of information with each other? So uh, we had very different approaches. What what I what I what I would say about Shane is we share quite a lot, a lot more um, traits than people would imagine. Not in the way we bowl because our approaches are different. Warney tried to keep people in the crease. I tried to get people coming out of the crease. Um, I think that what we shared in common was our brutal determination. So neither of us really care what anybody else said about us. We didn't care what the umpires said what batsmen said, what opponents said. We, we just brutal focus and determination. And, you know, I'm sure there's moments of, you know, moments of self-doubt with, with Shane too, but, you know, maybe more with me. But um, we, we knew what we wanted do and we went out and did it and I did it because people said I couldn't do it and that's why I did it. Shane did it because people said he, that he couldn't do it and a, a lot of, if you talk to a sports psychologist, they might say I, um, you can't have that as a motivation because it's negative. I totally disagree with it. The the Jordan show on, you know, uh, the streaming platforms at the moment, his um, um, Hall of Fame acceptance speech, all he talked about was all of the people who had got stuck into him as he was developing. If you become Michael Jordan because somebody's got stuck into you, I'll take that. What do you want to be, Michael Jordan or just somebody who's uh, you know, very gracious? <laughs> yeah. I'll be Michael Jordan, thanks. <laughs> I think one of the interesting things about him as well was he spoke about the reason he made all the shots was because he's missed so many. And I think oh. that's 
probably relatable for spinners and especially wrist spinners. Like you're gonna you're gonna bowl bad balls. You're miss, man. Yeah. You get listen. You're gonna miss, but we don't define cricket. Is not well. Bowlers particularly aren't defined by the misses. You're defined by the good balls. I'm defined by the wickets. You don't remember. Look, you might remember some of the bad balls. I remember all of them. But you, but you, but the wickets are what goes up on the board. When when you're on the board at Lords, you know, and I'm not, unfortunately, I didn't get to play a test match there. But you're on the board at Lords. You got five for you know, seventy or whatever. They don't put in brackets, but he also bowled 150 bad balls. Good five for 70. You know what I mean? Who cares about the bad ones? Definitely. Like, talking towards the back end of your, well, I guess your first playing stint, like what, um, obviously you had to retire through injury. Like, physically... Like for you, especially like the amount you put on the ball, it probably put a massive force through your body. Would you have done anything different physically throughout your career? Mate, you know what? Um, I don't think there is anything. I, I spoke to Damian Martin about this actually. I think I'm actually in favour of rotation. I think having a break every now and then is probably a good thing. You might not agree with it or believe in it at the time, but if you know that it means that you're going to be able to play for longer, because bearing, you know, for most of us, it's the only thing we'll ever be good at. Um, if you have the opportunity to have a break every now and then, it's probably a good thing. So I, I am in favour of rotation. The best season we had at Knotts while I was there, I think we had six fast bowlers and we did rotate them. They played three games and then they were out. Didn't matter if they got six wickets. The last game, they were out. That's it. And a couple of times there was... But we cleaned up. It was... It was a very, and it was a great example for me because we, we guaranteed everybody that they were all in it. Nobody, not once did we stray from the rotation. Um, like still to this day, even right now, I can't feel the ends of my fingers. So from top knuckle up, they're, they're just, they're just, you know, both hands, just, there's just nothing there. Um, that may have happened anyway. But I might have played for longer. It still would have been probably the case, but I might have played for longer if I'd been able to... And by the way... I would have been the first one to say no uh, to a rotation, but maybe it's a good idea. I, I think um, I think it's a good idea for some players and um, even some batsmen. Um, so I know Marto, you know, said to me, David. He said to me, he just needed a little bit of a break at one point, and. I think we're starting to see that more and more and more in, in professional sport. Um, and I know you've, you've had a number of players in, you know, um, English cricket who have taken a little bit of time out. And I think it's a good idea uh, because taking into account the fact it's the only thing we're ever going to be good at and that we're actually quite good at what we do, you want us around for as long as we possibly can be. And inducting new players into the mix is a good thing too. 
So there's no loss really from a national point of view. Um, it's only upside and it's great for the players as individuals because they get a break upstairs and they get a break physically if required. And um, then when they're finished, they know they're finished and they're comfortable with it. And um, they know they've done their best for their country um, and their teammates, more importantly. What, what do you think, like, reflecting on your career, like, what performance are you most proud of? And what, what do you think clicked for that to be your best performance? Um, I had some, I had some good games, but probably the best, well, the one that made me happiest, we played against the West Indies in Barbados. Don't remember what year, maybe 2003. Um, and... Steve Waugh was the captain. And we made the West Indies follow on. And it was very, very hot. The pitch was stupidly flat. I was playing against Brian Lara. Um, and Steve came up to the bowlers. I don't... I rem oh, and it sounds stupid, but I remember... Dizzy, Jason Gillespie and myself because he was talking to both of us and he said, because Steve didn't like enforcing the follow-on at all, following the Indian debacle years before. But he, he, said, to, he said to us, he said, um, there's only one team in the world who can win this match. There's only one bowling attack in the world who could win this match by enforcing the follow-on, and it's you guys. What do you want to do? And I've always been a big fan of enforcing the follow-on because I like when you got someone I like <laughs> foot on throat. I like crushing people. And I think the best thing to do is I like enforcing the follow-on. But he asked us. And he said, there's only one, yeah, as I said, only one team in the world who can do it. Do you want to? And I think we were in the field, so five-day test match. I think we bowled for two and a half, almost three days in total. And then we needed maybe 80 or 100 runs in the last inning to win. And we won. And I think I got... Uh, nine wickets, five and uh, yeah, I think I got five and four in the test, and that because of how hard it was, I remember afterwards just feeling completely spent and drained, and um, um, <laughs> like. Didn't even go out afterwards. I just just sat. I was. We were just. We were exhausted, but it was so satisfying because it was a really really big win for us because we'd done something that, as Steve War said, he didn't believe any other bowling attack in the world could do, and so I may have got better statistic. Lee speaking, I may have got better performances on the board, but that was the one that I loved the most. Yeah, I know. Like when we've had chats, we always spoke so highly of Steve War, so that praise probably meant a lot to you. So I'm going to wrap up, Stu. You've been really good with your time, mate. The, the last thing that I've asked um, is, but is for one bit of on field and one bit of off field advice for any, any spinners out there. So, what would be the things that stand out for you? Okay, the off-field advice yeah. is that there's no point studying on the morning of an exam. So work out what 
could go wrong and what you want to go right way before you go into a game. Write it down. Doesn't matter. You don't have to share it with anyone. Write it down and then work out how you're going to cope with that. Deal with it. And then if you make a mistake and it doesn't work out, that's totally okay. You find one person that you know who doesn't make mistakes. If you find somebody that doesn't make mistakes, give me a buzz because I'd like to meet them. But preparation is the key. Yeah. I think that, that right. Second down, thing. Yeah. Writing down's come up a few times in this chat and you spoke about um, getting me to get that exercise book to do my homework from the first session. And like, I've, I've still got that book and it's basically full from the chats we used to have in the cafe there. Like, and I think that's, that's massive to, and writing down is it's such a simple thing to do, but it just gives you that clarity. The thing is that, that most sports men and women don't learn the same way as a banker or an accountant or a solicitor. Um, so we need to learn through as many different aspects of information as we possibly can. You must write it down. You must listen to it. You must watch it. You, just watching video, if I watch video, I just fall asleep. Um, video feedback for me is just, it bores me. I don't even bother with it. It, it kills me. But I want to hear people talking about it. I want to see it written down. I like, I like it. And I get big pieces of butcher's paper for me. I asked you to get a, a, an exercise book because it would have been weird to have butcher's paper on the floor. <laughs> but I like, you know, the big pieces of paper. I love it. And that's how I write things about my life now. I write it down and I put it in boxes and it's cool. So write things down, listen to it, work it out. That's the off field and set goals, goal setting. Come on, goal setting. Um, and you don't need to share those goals with anybody else and don't be ashamed about them. If you think you're better than somebody else, you want them to get picked because if you're right, they'll get dropped. So <laughs> remember that. But the on-field advice as a bowler, not as a batsman, as a bowler, is remembering that your job is completed before the batsman even gets involved. So all you need to do is wash, rinse, repeat. You just keep doing the same thing over and over and over. And if you try and bowl your best ball and it's wrong and it doesn't go where you want it to, it doesn't mean that you change anything. You go back to the top of your mark and you try and do the same thing again. And it's okay. And then if the dude hits it for four or six, it still doesn't mean you've done the wrong thing. Go back and do it again. Go back and do it again. Go back and do it again. And if you're getting smashed, if you can look me dead in the eyes and tell me that you bowled your best ball, six balls in a row, then we can have a chat about maybe next, next steps. But none of you can. <laughs> No, that's great advice and something that has definitely served me and, and others uh, very well since we've met you, Stewie. So, um, so, yeah, so thanks a lot for your time, mate. I'll uh, let you get back to the restaurant. Now, yeah, Mr Badger, I've got one uh, question for you, uh, which is very, very important. Um, should I stop, should I stop recording like, or keep it going? <laughs> no, I think, you should, I think you should continue recording. Oh, well, apart from the fact that I'm going to embarrass you here. Um, this is podcast four or five? Uh, so I've released five and right. recorded a few more. Mm -hmm. so I don't know what number. This okay, is. yeah, quite interesting. So um, uh, but perhaps you could explain to me why I wasn't podcast one. 
Well, I think I'll probably message you at the start. <laughs> <laughs> I also thought I better, in, like I did Parky number one and I thought, right, I'll interview him. And then by the time I get to the great man himself, I'll be finely tuned in, in how to do it. Oh, I see. Oh, so you think this is as polished as you're going to get? <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. I told you, mate, I'm a leg spinner, not a radio producer. No, you're Mr. Badger. <laughs> hey, Dobby, I love you, man. Anytime you want to talk to me, anytime any of your friends want to talk to me, I, you know where I am. No, uh, thanks, Jay. Well, thanks for coming on. I'll, uh, I'll stop recording now. <laughs> we can continue this chat. <laughs> thanks, mate.